The Devil's Signature by A. Ellis Honeyberger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Devil's Signature by A. Ellis Honeyberger. It was the last night of my summer vacation. Within the ballroom of the mountain resort, crowds of young people were gliding languidly to the strains of Home Sweet Home, a favorite ruse of the rural musicians to announce the end of the evening's gaieties. It meant more than that to me. It meant goodbye to the mountains and trout streams. It meant town again and the dull grind of a newspaper office, for I handled the police end of a big Baltimore journal. As I stood on the veranda gazing gloomily down the vista of electric globes that marked the path of the river road below, a shadow fell across the broad band of light issuing from the ballroom window, and I turned to face Ethel Vandiver. "'Mr. Sanford!' she exclaimed in a voice that was plainly agitated. "'How you startled me!' "'Whom were you expecting to find?' I inquired, somewhat amused at having caught such a charming girl as Ethel in an escapade. Shh, she whispered, coming up and placing two dainty fingers on my lips. Someone is going to meet me here tonight. You knew I'm returning home in an hour or so. I'm awfully glad to have seen you again, though you did not come near me tonight or ask me to dance. Ethel had a divine pout. I guess, you know, I don't dance, I replied. And you were surrounded by so many young gallants that I contented myself with admiring you at a distance. That sounds like a bachelor, she said with an attempt at gaiety. But I noticed her eyes furtively sought out each corner of the veranda. I didn't exactly relish the situation, and soon made my adieus, leaving her standing there alone, looking out into the night. Later, when I ran across Douglas Hamilton in the billiard room, I felt I knew the secret of that rendezvous. I could not but remember that previous to this evening I had seen neither Ethel Vandiver nor Douglas Hamilton since the university finals of 1890-blank, when all the college world was talking of the rapt devotion shown by Dizzy Doug for the little Richmond Bell with a titch and red hair and big gray eyes who had taken the arcades by storm. She was then a winsome slip of a girl just out of a convent and catching her first breath of real life. That Douglas Hamilton was a devilish sort of a chap placed him at no disadvantage in her eyes. In fact, tales at which staid professors and their wives frowned rather added to her interest in the handsome prodigal. The worst that could be said of Douglas of those days was that he was a good fellow. When the college bell had been found suspended from the awning in front of Morrison's bookstore at the foot of the grounds, folks shook their heads and said, Hamilton again or when the Z.T. coat of arms appeared on the cupola of the rotunda, it was Doug's work in overtime. And the chances were, at that moment, the culprit was in a back room in Mark's place, narrating the escapade to a choice party of fellow roisterers. Then would come repentance, and weeks when Hamilton rarely would be seen, weeks when no latch-string hung outside his door, and his life was a sealed book even to his intimates. During such periods he was another man, morose and studious. Always at examination time he came out with flying colors, and that fact alone kept him in college. The faculty forgave him for the marks he made. It was with the advent of Ethel Vandiver that Douglas Hamilton seemed to take on a new lease of life. From the moment he saw her, I believe, she became the ruling passion of his life, and when I ran across them on the lawn during commencement of that year, and noted, as they sat in the shadow of a mighty elm, how scant the space between the crown of golden hair and his own dark curls, I felt that a happy future was in store for my friend, for he was my friend, and I inwardly congratulated him. "'Doug, you old reprobate!' I exclaimed as I let him out into the open. "'Tell me what you've been doing with yourself during the past two years.' Hamilton smiled. It wasn't a particularly happy smile. Chasing. Chasing Ethel most of the time, he replied dejectedly. Indeed. I thought she liked you well enough over there at Charlottesville, I said banteringly. It's the governor, Billy. He's got no manner of use for me. 
took Ethel to Europe to divert her mind and all that. Then he told me how he had graduated in law and was practicing in a forsaken little town not many miles from that very spot. He'd met with some success, but not enough, I gathered, to satisfy old Vandiver. I thought I detected something about Hamilton's eyes that suggested another reason for Major Vandiver's dislike, and the suspicion was not dispelled when, after we had entered the café at my invitation, I saw him pour a drink of liquor that made the bartender stare. I'm a little unnerved tonight, he said to me, half apologetically. I wanted to ask him more about Ethel and the meeting on the veranda, of which I felt assured, but on second thought I dismissed the idea. I did not see Hamilton next morning, for I was busy packing my one trunk and bidding adieu to the friends I had acquired during my two weeks' stay at the Springs. The stage left at two o'clock, but it must have been about one, I think, when I got the following telegram relayed by telephone from Rockville, the nearest station. Sensational murder at Madison. Cover fully. Wire night report by ten. Wilson. Wilson was telegraph editor of the Planet, and I wasn't at all sorry for the diversion. Madison was not more than twelve miles distant on a little railroad that ran down the valley from Harper's Ferry. It was about two when I left the springs in an open buggy, and four when I pulled up in front of the county jail. An undersheriff met me. Yes, there had been a murder at Hilltop. A French woman killed. He didn't know any particulars, all the principal officers being at the scene. Half an hour later I was entering the grounds. Hilltop was one of those delightful southern homes which had survived the ravages of war and reconstruction. It stood back a mile from the road, and the driveway, bordered by elms and oak trees, was surrounded by rich farming lands. The mansion was colonial in design, with massive pillars, and the negro quarters in the rear gave the place an atmosphere keenly relished by all lovers of the old southern regime. The house itself was of brick, two stories high, with two-story wings extending on both sides, and forming a courtyard through which a rose-bordered pathway led up to the portico. As I alighted from the buggy, another rig dashed up, and to my surprise and pleasure, for I didn't know exactly what was in store for me, I saw that one of its occupants was John Huff, a Baltimore detective I knew well, and with whom I had been in several previous adventures. "'Huff, by all that's marvelous, how did you get here?' I cried, grasping his hand. I might ask the same of you, Billy. All I know is this. And he handed me a telegram. Dinsmore's Detective Agency, Balto. Send one of your best men at once on murder case. Expense no object. Take first train. R. K. Vandiver. Vandiver? I exclaimed in amazement. Could this be the home of Ethel Vandiver? Murder? At this moment a portly old gentleman walked hurriedly down the steps. I'm Major Vandiver he said. I suppose you, or one of you, glancing from one to the other, is from Dinsmore's. I'm Detective Huff, replied my companion, and this is Mr. Sanford, reporter for the Planet. Indeed, exclaimed the Major, eyeing me doubtfully. Oh, I'll vouch for this young man, said Huff, taking him by the arm, and we followed our host into the library, a spacious room in the east wing of the mansion. From the library a door led into a bedroom, and we could see two men, one of whom was the coroner, leaning over the corpse of a woman. The major related the story with as much calmness as he could muster. He and his daughter had returned from Europe recently, bringing with them Marie Lefebvre, a French maid. Not desiring to remain in Richmond during the heated season, the major, who had purchased Hilltop the winter previous, brought Ethel and the maid there for the remainder of the summer. This was their third day in the mountains. The first night had been passed quietly at Hilltop, but on the second the Major and his daughter had driven to the springs, returning about midnight. For some reason Ethel had expressed a disinclination to occupy her own room, and slept in one adjoining his on the second floor, assigning her bed to the maid. About two o'clock, he should judge, the household had been awakened by blood-curdling shrieks from the first floor, and followed by his servants he had rushed downstairs in scant attire, burst into the room, and found the maid weltering in her own blood and breathing her last. The apartment had been searched immediately, but no one had been found. The screen fastings of the windows were intact, and it had been necessary to burst the lock in order to enter. The key, too, was on the inside. 
To add to the mystery, no weapon of any description had been discovered. The crime was peculiarly brutal and appeared to be the work of a madman. The woman had been stabbed twice in the region of the heart, and her head and face were fearfully beaten. The bed resembled a shambles, but only one splash of blood had reached the floor. Major Vanderer was completely unnerved as he concluded. To think, he exclaimed, that but for a caprice it would have been my little girl. And that poor woman, how can I explain such a thing to her people in France? They'll never believe it. There's something more than wrong about this, Mr. Huff, I had almost said. Something supernatural. Then he told us how Ethel had been taken in hysterics to the home of a neighbor, and how almost all of the servants had fled the place in terror. I give you carte blanche, Huff. It's worth five thousand dollars to the man who gets to the bottom of it. As for you, young man, turning on me, all I ask is that you don't make your story too fantastic. Tell only the facts. The public doesn't care for your surmises. I want to be placed right in the matter. Do you understand? I assured him that what I sent to my paper would not displease him, and he left us. Taking a carriage driven by a crippled old man I afterward found to be the gardener, who with a negress named Martha alone remained of the half-dozen employees of the family. I stuck by Huff, for I knew of old that he was a newsmaker, a man of perhaps fifty-five, five feet eight, clean-shaven, wiry, with iron-gray hair. He looked and was the typical detective of the old school. And while he did not take the newspapers into his confidence when on a case, he had the reputation of treating the men squarely, handing out good stories to those upon whom he knew he could depend not to hamper his work. He knew me, too, and had confidence in my discretion, so I followed him into the room of death without awaiting formal permission. We found Dr. Wilson, the coroner, entirely nonplussed. "'There is absolutely nothing,' he said, "'to throw any light on this murder. I'm free to say I have never heard of such a crime outside of a storybook. There's nothing missing, and so far as we can learn, the woman not only had no enemy, but was a stranger here, and had been in this country but a few weeks. The lock on the one door had been broken, and indeed the door had been driven almost off its hinges. The bed occupied an alcove between two windows, which were secured, as the Major had said. A bureau, dressing table, trunk, a couple of easy chairs, and an old-fashioned wardrobe built into the brick wall completed the furniture. The floor, which was of hard wood and carpetless, revealed to the cursory glance but a single splotch of blood. "'When do you convene the jury?' inquired the detective. "'Within an hour. I think I hear some of the panel outside the house. Be careful not to disturb anything, won't you?' And we were alone in the room. Huff went down on his hands and knees and over the floor rapidly. He had few moments to spare. Without, we could hear the voices of many men, and they were upon us before he could finish his task. "'Keep them out a moment, doctor,' he called as the door opened. The coroner looked in for a moment. "'Putting on a Sherlock Holmes touch?' he inquired in a slightly amused and somewhat bored tone. Huff didn't answer, but a moment later I saw him pause and scan the floor intently. His attitude was at first one of incredulity, then of amazement. He looked up at me curiously. "'What is it?' I cried, springing to his side. "'Look,' whispered Huff, pointing to the floor. I looked and drew back in horror. As clearly outlined in blood as if it had been the work of an artist was the print of a hoof on the hardwood floor. 2. Hilltop, I learned, had a history of romance and tragedy even before the advent of the Vandevers. Built in the early forties by Colonel William D. Schaefer, it had been known until his death as the Schaefer Estate. The owner, a Unionist, had incurred the enmity of the countryside during the Civil War, and the place had been raided a number of times by Confederate cavalry and guerrillas, who, however, had never been able to capture their quarry. Tradition said the colonel had provided himself with a secret hiding place, but the secret, if there was one, had been buried with him. At the termination of the war he found himself in financial straits, and at his death the place had been sold under the hammer. There had been numerous occupants since that time, but none had remained any length of time, and all seemed glad to be rid of it. According to the old negress, Martha, the house was supposed to be haunted by the ghost of Schaefer's daughter, who had been deserted on her wedding eve 
and who after a few years had died in the very room in which Marie Lefebvre was murdered. This story found much credence among the darkies of the neighborhood, few of whom could be persuaded to approach the mansion after nightfall. After wiring my story at the village telegraph office that night, I made my way along the winding street toward the one hotel the place afforded. I made a wrong turn, however, and pulled up in front of a two-story office building. A sign in one of the lower windows caught my eye. Douglas Hamilton, Lawyer. The home of Douglas Hamilton. The forsaken little village he had mentioned the other night up in the mountains. There was no light in the window, but when I reached the hotel and asked Henwell, the proprietor, about Doug, I found him very communicative indeed. Mr. Hamilton, he said, has a room in this hotel, but he left for the spring some days ago and hasn't shown up since. It seems a pity, too, for a number of his clients have been asking for him. He'll never build up a practice that way. He confided to me that he didn't exactly understand Hamilton. Anyway, nobody did. The youth, it seemed, had a habit of disappearing at intervals without furnishing any clue to his whereabouts, and it was whispered among town folk on such occasions that Hamilton was off on a bat, though no one ever caught him in the act. I forgot all about Hamilton, however, a little later, when John Huff entered my room, and throwing himself into a chair began to tell me that we were up against the worst specimen of villainy that had ever come under his consideration. Of course, he said. There ain't nothing supernatural about it. I've been in the business too long to be taken by such a stiff as that. The hoof mark, for instance, ain't going to throw me off the track of a real flesh-and-blood murderer. Now he, I say he, because no woman could have conceived or carried out such a crime, he might be able to scare off some of these country constables by planting such a fake as that. I guess he thought that's what he'd be up against. Billy, he continued, leaning forward and emphasizing the remark with his fist, I don't believe the murderer wanted to kill that French woman any more than he wanted to kill you. If not, who was he after? Whose room was it he slept in? You don't mean. I mean this. I want to know all about that Vandiver girl's antecedents, who her friends were, and her enemies if she had any. Above all, I want to see her and have her tell me why she declined to sleep in that room the night of the murder. When we had cornered the Major at Hilltop the next day, Huff went straight at the root of the matter. It seems to me, Major Vandiver, that there is one person in the world, save the murderer himself, who can throw any light on this mystery. Explain yourself. I mean your daughter Ethel. She slept in the room the night previous to the crime, and for some reason, you say caprice, declined to repeat the performance. But, man, what you ask is impossible. Ethel is hysterical. She's been ever since the tragedy. The doctor says the subject mustn't be mentioned to her. Well, we must wait, then. I wish you would tell me, though, under just what circumstances you came into possession of this property. There is not much to be told. The property was recently thrown on the market by a trust company, and I bought it. I've stopped at the springs near here for a number of years, and I knew all about it. But previous to this week, I was never inside the place in all my life. Who did you find here? Martha, the negro cook, Craven, the gardener, and several field darkies. I retained them in my employ because they had no other home and were old family retainers. Martha once belonged to Colonel Schaefer. Huff took a new tack. Tell me, he said, where your daughter, Miss Vandiver, was when you first saw her after hearing the cries. Ethel? She? Ah, now I recall distinctly. Ethel was standing at the front door, terror-stricken. It all comes to me now, that look of horror, that effort to escape the sight of it all. The girl fainted when she realized what had happened, and this Mrs. Rose, a neighbor, took her off. Now why do you ask me all that? There is a possibility, Major, that this is what we call an inside job, and it's necessary to place each member of the household. Where was Martha? Martha? Up in the front attic. She passed me on the stairway. Craven? He came down as fast as he could after Martha. He's a cripple, you know, and sleeps in the attic, too. Any others in the house? No, that's, that's all. Cook, maid, and gardener. They followed you down or passed you on the stairs? Yes, I told you that. And Miss Vandiver was, as I understand you, in the hallway as you reached the landing. Trying to get out the front door, yes. In her nightclothes? Yes, no. 
when I come to think of it, she was dressed. Hm. What the devil, sir? Major Vandiver, do you believe in ghosts? No, sir, I don't. Nor do I. Is there any one that the death of your daughter would profit in any way? The Major was plainly startled for a moment. You suspect, then, he said in a low voice, what has entered my mind more than once since this tragedy. You suspect that it was the life of my child the murderer sought. It's barely possible, answered the detective. There is no one on earth, he spoke slowly and distinctly, to whom the death of my daughter would be of any benefit, so far as my knowledge goes. Has your daughter ever had a love affair? Serious, I mean. Hamilton, it came to me like a flash, and I felt an indefinable dread as to what the question portended. Then the Major blurted the thing out, and I heard my friend's reputation torn to shreds without the opportunity of defending him. Painted by Major Vandiver, Douglas Hamilton was a roué of the first magnitude, scarcely fit to touch the skirts of a woman like his daughter. He told how he had schemed to rescue Ethel from his wiles, and of the final renunciation followed by the trip to Europe. He did not even know Hamilton's present place of abode, so completely had he lost track of him in the past year. Huff gave the Major free rope, and after he had condemned Douglas to his heart's content, I thought I detected a gleam of exultation in the detective's eye. What next? I inquired of him as we parted at the door. Hamilton, he answered laconically. That night I sat in the library at Hilltop, waiting for Huff. I wanted a good story for the morning edition, and he had hinted that he would have a sensation. I had taken some of the edge off the Major's remarks about Hamilton, telling the detective of our friendship, and assuring him that the man was incapable of any connection with crime. "'I don't want your friend for murder, Billy,' Huff had said. "'I only want what he knows, and I must have that, even if it's necessary to arrest him. But I've got to find him first. The body of the ill-fated maid had been buried during the afternoon, and the coroner's jury was to meet in another three days to consider the case. Major Vandiver had taken up his abode with his daughter at the Rose Cottage, and save for the servants I had the place to myself. Huff was later than he had indicated, and I paced the room uneasily. The student lamp was burning low on the table. Suddenly I heard a faint sound from the inner room, and paused to listen, every nerve in my body on the alert. There it was again a half sigh, half groan. Turning the lamp on full, I sprang to the door and flung it open. I was scarcely prepared for what I saw. In the center of the room stood a collie dog, which I remembered to have seen about the place. The animal was crouching as in terror, every hair on his body erect. The head was lowered, and the teeth glistening. Then as the glare of the light reached his eyes, the dog gave a low growl and bounded past me and out into the darkness. Did I imagine it, or did the doors of the wardrobe softly close? Then I recovered and leaped to the spot, tearing open the doors and clutching in vain for a hidden foe. Then I laughed at my fears. The light revealed each nook and cranny of the wardrobe, and there was nothing. By Jove, I believe I'm getting nutty, I muttered as I backed to the table. I suppose the hoof mark will turn out to be a myth, too, but I'll be darned if that dog was. The lamp began to flicker again preparatory to going out, and I had no wish to brave the darkness of that room just then. Hurriedly, I placed the lamp on the floor near the spot where Huff had discovered the ghastly symbol. I received a further shock when I found that it, too, had vanished. 3. In answer to my summons, Nathan Craven hobbled into the room with a newly filled lamp. I had tried to draw the old man into conversation earlier in the day, but had found it difficult to get anything out of him. He had a reputation for taciturnity, acting in that respect as a foil for Martha, who was volubility itself. These faithful old servants had been on the estate so long that they seemed a part of it, and Martha always referred to the mansion as our house. As Craven shuffled out the door, Huff appeared suddenly, and I saw the former shrink as if from a blow. "'Guess his nerves are to the bad, too,' said the detective. He was evidently elated over something, and I awaited his report before springing my own sensational experience. "'Things are coming my way, Billy,' he said with evident satisfaction. 
I'm not going to tell you all, but I'll let you in on this much. I've got Hamilton placed, and I can lay my hands on him when needed. Of course, I don't know the man as you do. If I did, it might change some of my views. But I feel that after I've had a talk with him and with Ethel Vandiver, I can get a line on things. What are the hoof mark? Oh, you know I disregarded that from the first. What, I said, coming over to his side, if I told you it had discarded itself, disappeared this very night? I'd say you're daft. It may have disappeared all right. Not likely that the old woman hadn't cleaned up in there since the murder. But she'll tell you no. I thought of that myself. Then I gave him an account of what had occurred, and for the first time in my life I saw John Huff startled, startled to the point of momentary speechlessness. If it was any other case, and any other reporter, I'd say it was a plant. But I know you wouldn't try that on me. I thought he entered the room rather cautiously this time, and when he came out I read bewilderment in his face. I don't like it, Billy. I haven't much faith in spooks, but I have an abundance of respect for them, especially the particular brand that is floating around this infernal house. I didn't tell you of an experience of my own yesterday, because I could hardly believe it myself, and I didn't think you would. I'd been nosing around a good deal. I'd had old Martha and Craven on the rack, with little satisfaction to myself. That old codger's half loony anyway. They don't know anything, or if they do, they're mum. Well, just about dusk, I entered this wing of the building upstairs. I didn't have a light and was gum-shoeing my way along when I heard what sounded like a shuffling of feet just ahead of me. I don't think my nerves are what they used to be. I hesitated, and that settled it. I swear something was in that room just over this one. I felt and heard it. Yet when I lit the hall lamp and searched the place, there was nothing. Not a thing. Not a chance for it to escape. And nothing. Yet you heard a noise, you say. It was something tangible. Yes, something tangible that vanished. You know, Billy, he went on after a long pause, if this was the house proper, I'd swear there was a secret passage leading into the room. But what have you? Two brick walls standing free at that point. Could anything be more absurd than a man could disappear through one of them? I let my early report stand for the day's work, and Huff and I lounged about in the library chairs for the remainder of the night. I fell asleep a number of times, always to awaken suddenly, but I don't think Huff closed his eyes. Each time I looked at him, they were fixed upon that bedroom door. It fell to my lot to introduce Detective Huff to Ethel Vandiver. I didn't relish the job, for I had an inkling of what was about to happen. Had I known all, though, wild horses could not have dragged me to that little cottage. Poor little Ethel looked the shadow of her former self. Her face was wan, and there was a nameless dread in the lovely gray eyes as she appeared to us in the parlor that day. The girl regarded me at first with surprise, and then, I thought, with appeal. I knew I was to see a detective, but this is an unexpected pleasure, she said to me as I took her hand. You are right, Miss Vandiver, I replied. This is a detective, Detective Huff of Baltimore. I'm merely here for my paper. Then pray let's have it over with at once, she said with a glance at me that I interpreted as readily as if she had asked me to be silent as to Douglas Hamilton. I felt like a dog then, as Huff began. Miss Vandiver, I'm forced to ask you some very personal questions, but the matter is so serious that I hope you will see their propriety and bear with me to the end. I am perfectly willing to tell you all I know, she answered in a low voice. How long have you known Douglas Hamilton? The effect was instantaneous, and for a moment I thought she would faint, but she didn't and presently answered him, calmly enough, I met him at Charlottesville two years ago. I think anger at what she supposed my treachery overcame all other feelings for the moment. When did you see him last? Monday evening. At the Springs? Yes. Ethel cast a scornful glance at me. Now pardon me, Miss Vandiver, but I must know in exactly what relation you stand to each other. Must I go into that? she implored. I'm afraid you must. Douglas Hamilton loves me. We were together a great deal until father heard of some escapades and made me dismiss him. After that, 
Well, he importuned me again and again. That night at the springs he urged me to go away with him. I wouldn't, and he— Ethel was weeping softly now. The detective waited until she had recovered somewhat. Will you finish that sentence now, Miss Vanderer? He threatened to kill himself. Ah, now, Miss Vanderer, you haven't seen Hamilton since then, have you? No. What made you change rooms with your maid that night? said Huff suddenly. The girl's pallor increased. I was frightened the night before, she said, by noises in the room, and fled out into the library where I spent the remainder of the night on the sofa. I told Marie about it, and she laughed at me. It was upon her suggestion that we made the change. What kind of noises? It seemed to me that someone was walking downstairs into the room. Ah! Which was absurd, of course, as the stairway is in the middle of the building. Then an unaccountable dread came over me. I saw nothing, heard nothing, but somehow I felt I was not alone. Did you lock the door? Yes, I did not close my eyes again during the night. The girl shuddered at the memory of it. The night of the murder, resumed Huff. Your father found you at the front door as he came down the steps. Again that look of dread in the girl's eyes. Yes, I was there. Fully dressed? Yes. You had heard the screams and rushed down ahead of your father. No. There was an awkward pause. Then why, please, were you there? It was a signal that brought me down. Her lip was quivering. I expected to meet someone. Who? pursued the detective unrelentingly. Douglas, she said tearfully. He told me he would give me one more chance. Otherwise I would never see him again. He talked wildly, and it frightened me. He was to give the signal, a whistle, and I was to come and join him. At first I couldn't bring myself to it. But you started? Yes. I decided to go out. As I got to the front door, I heard the screaming. Oh, such screaming! It will haunt me always, I think. Now, Miss Vandiver, I have but one more question, and I thank you very much. How long after you heard the whistle did you descend the steps? A quarter, or perhaps half an hour? She left us without so much as a glance at me, and with no realization of the predicament in which her answer to that last question had placed the one she loved best on earth. 4. Huff had charge of affairs at the coroner's inquest. Not a word of Hamilton. Ethel Vandiver was not even called to the stand. I knew his game and his contempt for the inquest, which I had often heard him declare served only too often to defeat the ends of justice by slowing the prosecutor's hand. Major Vandiver narrated the facts, and Martha and Craven substantiated them. Then Huff rang the changes on the supernatural end of the affair. Hoof and all! And when he had finished, I told my tale without reserve, and without expecting anyone to believe it. A smile of incredulity passed down the line of bearded, horny-handed mountaineers, and when the testimony was in, and the coroner asked whether there were any questions, one juror arose and said, I would like to know what particular asylum these two men escaped from. The usual verdict of death at the hands of someone to the jury unknown was duly entered, and that phase of the affair was closed. Next day the Vanderers left town. I had Ethel for a few moments to myself in the parlor of the Rose Cottage, and I made her understand that I had no part in the ordeal she had undergone. "'Mr. Sanford,' she said, "'I am going from here forever, I hope. I could never re-enter this dreadful house, and Father is going to get rid of it at the earliest opportunity.' Now I am going to confide in you the one fact that I did not tell the detective, and which only three persons in the world know. I am the wife of Douglas Hamilton. What? I exclaimed. Let me get that again. The wife of Douglas Hamilton. Since when, pray? Since a night in September of last year, the night before I sailed for Europe. Then why all this? It's a long story, Mr. Sanford, and I don't feel equal to it now. I have loved Douglas ever since that night at the finals when you ran across us on the lawn. Do you recall? Well, Father would have none of it. And anyway, Douglas wasn't in a position to marry. 
He was so madly jealous, though, of every man that had so much as looked at me that I consented to marry him in New York. Since my return he has wanted me to come with him, or let him assert himself. But I could not bear father should know I had deceived him, especially as the object of the trip abroad was to separate us. You know where Doug is now? Oh, Mr. Sanford, if I only did, said the girl, her eyes filling, I'd be the happiest woman in the world. That's why I tell you all this. Will you find him for me, if you can? He is your friend as well as my husband. And tell him that I am brave now. I am willing to go with him to the end of the world. Even now Ethel did not realize the peril in which she had placed Hamilton. I departed without enlightening her. I was glad she was well out of Madison when Huff burst into my room that night about ten o'clock with a brand new sensation. Billy, he exclaimed, I've got my man, the ghost, real flesh and blood, and caught on the spot. Speak up, man, I cried. Out with it. What the devil do you mean? I mean that I arrested Douglas Hamilton on the grounds at Hilltop tonight. Hamilton? Huff, you're mad and I almost laughed to think how thoroughly he was duped. "'You may laugh, Sanford,' said Huff, much put out. "'But I tell you, the man is now in the county jail, and the whole business will be public property in the morning.' I thought hard. Of course such a thing must be prevented at all hazards. My friendship for Hamilton, the knowledge I possessed, and that final appeal in Ethel Vandiver's eyes all cried out against such a culmination. "'Tell me just how it occurred,' I said presently. "'In the first place,' commenced Huff, "'you must know that I placed Hamilton at a summer resort near Rockville some days ago. "'How I did it doesn't matter, nor how I knew he left the resort today for Madison. "'There's a mysterious sort of magnetism that draws a murderer back to the scene of his crime, "'and I, I lay for him, that's all. "'An hour ago, I caught him prowling around the lawn and closed in on him. He fought like a fiend until I let drop the fact that I was a detective and he my prisoner when he suddenly gave in and had the audacity to ask what I meant. For God's sake, what do you mean? These were his very words. Well, he declared he had never even heard of the crime and fired question after question at me as we drove into town. He seemed relieved to know you were here and wanted to see you at once. And I must see him at once, Huff. You have made a fearful mistake. I tell you I have facts in my possession that will make such a charge absurd. And I told him what I knew. It didn't faze him. What does that prove? he asked skeptically. Even granted he's her husband. He thought she had thrown him over, didn't he? But the condition of the doors, the windows. Hell, Huff, a trained detective like you ought to know, after talking to that man five minutes, that he is incapable of such a crime. I can't see Hamilton a prisoner. Come, what time is it? It was just eleven when we reached the jail, and we found Hamilton pacing his cell like a caged animal. At my direction he was brought out into the sheriff's office, and we three were closeted together. I told Doug just what we knew of his movements, and how certain points of the case seemed against him, but I scotched the idea of any connection on his part with the crime. This kind of talk seemed to act on him as a tonic, and he soon recovered nerve and balance, and launched into an explanation of his movements since the night of the murder. "'You know, Billy,' he said, "'I was always a rum sort of chap, even in my college days. I think I've always taken things too much to heart, little things that others would joke over.' Then Ethel came, and for the past two years I have thought of little but her. When she failed to answer my signal that night, I went away fully determined to end it all. But when I got back to the springs, I was fairly hauled up to the bar by a couple of fellows I knew, and the next thing I remember was the alum across the mountains. Drink is said to drive men to desperate deeds, but it doesn't have that effect on me. You know the old saying, when the devil was sick, the devil a monk would be. Well, that states my case. I called myself all manner of fools and determined to see Ethel again at all costs. How did I know she hadn't been detained or that she had heard my signal? That's the way I reasoned with myself. I got in here tonight after dark and started for Hilltop. I entered the grounds with some anxiety, I must confess, for I don't know what kind of a reception awaited me. But I was going to put up a bold front 
and demand to see Ethel, even if I had to tell Major Vandiver the whole story. I must have taken the wrong path, for I pulled up in front of the east wing of the building. There was a light in the second-story room, and I fancied it might be Ethel's, so I gave the signal she knew, a peculiar whistle, but to my astonishment the light was instantly whisked out, and the entire mansion was in darkness. Huff and I exchanged glances. As you may imagine, I began to feel a trifle upset, but I moved closer to the house, and I gave the signal again. As if in answer, a shutter moved slightly, and a man's face was revealed, peering cautiously out into the night. The sky was cloudy, but just then the moon, for one fitful moment, shot out and lighted up the scene like day. The sight I saw chilled my blood. Gentlemen, if it were my last moment on earth, I would swear the face at that window was the face of a madman. The head seemed covered with masses of unkempt hair, the beard was scraggly, the mouth drooping, revealing what seemed to be fangs rather than teeth. But it was the eyes, cruel, leering eyes, more than all else that unnerved me. For one brief second I gazed into the face of this monstrosity, and then it vanished. I stood as one stunned for how long I know not, doubting the evidence of my own senses. Then I was seized from behind and fought like a madman myself. You know the rest. 5. I, Billy Sanford, had been in some pretty ticklish adventures during my two years' experience as police reporter for the planet. I once accompanied detectives on a raid on an east side shipping office, where they'd kill a man for a nickel. I had, on another occasion, entered a low Curtis Bay pool room, rested its secrets, and exposed and closed the joint through an article in the Sunday issue. But I wouldn't have relished the task John Huff set himself that night. Hamilton and I accompanied him to Hilltop about one in the morning, and remained on the grounds within call in case we should be needed. We saw the detective let himself into the house through one of the library windows. As to what occurred thereafter, I give the version related to me by the detective. After satisfying himself as well as he might that he was unobserved, Huff threw open the door of the bedroom. Everything was all right, just as he had seen it earlier in the day, but he was taking no chances now. Baffled at every turn, the detective had decided that the real solution of the mystery lay in this very room, and that a continuation of the search elsewhere was idle. A careful examination revealed nothing. So far, so good. He had expected nothing. Then he stepped into the library, blew out his light, re-entered the chamber, locked the door behind him, and, pistol in hand, stationed himself in a corner. His iron nerve and years of training stood him in good stead now. The stillness was so intense that he could hear the beating of his own heart, yet his body was as rigid as the furniture around him. It was a trick he had forced himself to learn, and that had served him on many a former occasion. He heard the clock in the next room strike off the quarters, one, two, and then the hour. Was it fancy, or did he hear a sound overhead? Someone was coming downstairs. That annoyed him, for it might mean an interruption of his plans. Then Ethel's story flashed across his mind, and the fact that there were no stairs. The step came nearer, and then ceased altogether. Despite his courage, the detective began to feel a trifle creepy. At first he attributed this to his prolonged vigil. Then it gradually dawned on him that he was not alone. Something, some one, was moving in the opposite side of the room. It seemed the air was a trifle in motion, just a trifle. He leaned forward and strove to pierce the darkness. Just as he felt that he could stand the strain no longer, a tiny streak of light shot out and rested for an instant on the foot of the bed. He watched it as one hypnotized. Now it advanced, now receded. Then it disappeared altogether to reappear in another part of the room. Suddenly the light streamed full in his face and the spell was broken. Springing forward with a yell, he fired once, twice along that thread of light and rushed on into the wardrobe. When Hamilton and I, alarmed by the shots, rushed into the bedroom, we found Huff half-stunned. Yet when we flooded the place with light, we could find nothing to account for his alarm. Everything was intact. Huff had to admit it himself. But the bullets? We had heard the shots, and the detective threw out two empty cartridges on the library table. 
yet the most careful search of the room failed to disclose a bullet or bullet mark. 6. The first warning rays of dawn that stole in through the windows at Hilltop found three men still on guard in the east wing of the mansion. Huff and I were in the room above the library, examining for the hundredth time the quaint old wardrobe, a replica of the one in the chamber beneath. The detective crossed the room and threw up the window. The air was stifling, so noxious that we could scarcely breathe. "'There's no use,' he said. "'We're no nearer to the bottom of this thing than when we came up here. I thought possibly there might be some connection between these two wardrobes. Funny they should be so much alike.' But if there is, we can't find it. We might tear down the masonry, but it would be the deuce of a joke, wouldn't it, if we were mistaken? I tell you, old man, I'm sick of the whole business, and I'm going to take a sneak out of this cursed place this very day. I hate to give a thing up as much as any man, but I know when I've had enough. I don't know what directed my glance at that moment to the wardrobe, but what I saw fascinated me. The sun was just rising above a neighboring mountain peak, and a single ray through the shutter fell on the floor of the wardrobe where its reflection was cast back by a glistening point of steel. A step nearer, and the focus was lost. But when I ran my hand over the floor in that corner, I felt a small plate about the size of a ten-cent piece, which was raised just a fraction of an inch above the woodwork. Even as my hand touched it, there was a barely perceptible click and the entire back of the wardrobe disappeared from view, disclosing to our astonished gaze an opening in the wall the size of a human body. The secret out, the way clear, I started back, trembling as if stricken with ague. But Huff sprang past me, and it was flashing his dark lantern here and there in the opening. In a moment I was close to him, at his elbow, standing on a small wooden platform. Steps, somewhat narrower, led down to a similar platform on the floor below. Glancing down into the depths of that passageway, now illuminated by the rays of the lantern, I saw the most repulsive spectacle it was ever my misfortune to encounter. At the foot of the stairway lay the body of Nathan Craven, his figures distorted into the likeness of a demon, his hair and beard blood-soaked, and his eyes open and glassy. But it was not the ghastly countenance of the madman, nor the horrid gleam that beamed from the sightless eyes that made us fairly faint with horror and disgust. The maniac had removed his shoes, and the rays of the lantern revealed to us a sight we wished we might never see again. In place of one foot, nature, through some strange freak, had given Craven the hoof of a beast. End of the Devil's Signature by A. Ellis Henneberger Read by Winston Tharp The Enchanted Bluff by Willa Cather This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. We had our swim before sundown, and while we were cooking our supper the oblique rays of light made a dazzling glare on the white sand about us. The translucent red ball itself sank behind the brown stretches of cornfield as we sat down to eat, and the warm layer of air that had rested over the water and our clean sandbar grew fresher and smelled of the rank ironweed and sunflowers growing on the flatter shore. The river was brown and sluggish like any other of the half-dozen streams that water the Nebraska corn lands. On one shore was an irregular line of bald clay bluffs where a few scrub oaks with thick trunks and flat twisted tops threw light shadows on the long grass. The western shore was low and level, with cornfields that stretched to the skyline, and all along the water's edge were little sandy coves and beaches where slim cottonwoods and willow saplings flickered. The turbulence of the river in springtime discouraged milling, and beyond keeping the old red bridge in repair, the busy farmers did not concern themselves with the stream, so the Sandtown boys were left in undisputed possession. In the autumn we hunted quail through the miles of stubble and fodderland along the flat shore, and after the winter skating season was over and the ice had gone out, the spring freshets and flooded bottoms gave us our great excitement of the year. 
The channel was never the same for two successive seasons. Every spring the swollen stream undermined a bluff to the east or bit out a few acres of cornfield to the west and whirled the soil away to deposit it in spumy mud banks somewhere else. When the water fell low in midsummer, new sandbars were thus exposed to dry and whiten in the August sun. Sometimes these were banked so firmly that the fury of the next freshet failed to unseat them. The little willow seedlings emerged triumphantly from the yellow froth, broke into spring leaf, shot up into summer growth, and with their mesh of roots bound together the moist sand beneath them against the batterings of another April. Here and there a cottonwood soon glittered among them, quivering in the low current of air that even on the breathless days when the dust hung like smoke above the wagon road trembled along the face of the water. It was on such an island, in the third summer of its yellow-green, that we built our watch-fire, not in the thicket of dancing willow wands, but on the level terrace of fine sand which had been added that spring, a little new bit of world, beautifully ridged with ripple marks, and strewn with the tiny skeletons of turtles and fish, all as white and dry as if they had been expertly cured. We had been careful not to mar the freshness of the place, although we often swam out to it on summer evenings and lay on the sand to rest. This was our last watch-fire of the year, and there were reasons why I should remember it better than any of the others. Next week the other boys were to file back to their old places in Sandtown High School, but I was to go up to the Divide to teach my first county school in the Norwegian district. I was already homesick at the thought of quitting the boys with whom I had always played, of leaving the river, and going up to a windy plain that was all windmills and cornfields and big pastures, where there was nothing willful or unmanageable in the landscape, no new islands and no chance of unfamiliar birds such as often follow the watercourses. Other boys came and went and used the river for fishing or skating, but we six were sworn to the spirit of the stream, and we were friends mainly because of the river. There were the two hostler boys, Fritz and Otto, sons of the little German tailor. They were the youngest of us, ragged boys of ten and twelve with sunburned hair, weather-stained faces, and pale blue eyes. Otto, the elder, was the best mathematician in school and clever at his books, but he always dropped out in the spring term as if the river could not get on without him. He and Fritz caught the fat horned catfish and sold them about the town, and they lived so much in the water that they were as brown and sandy as the river itself. There was Percy Pound, a fat freckled boy with chubby cheeks, who took half a dozen boys' story papers and was always being kept in for reading detective stories behind his desk. There was Tip Smith, destined by his freckles and red hair to be the buffoon of all our games, though he walked like a timid little old man and had a funny cracked laugh. Tip worked hard in his father's grocery store every afternoon and swept it out before school in the morning. Even his recreations were laborious. He collected cigarette cards and tin tobacco tags indefatigably and would sit for hours humped up over a snarling little scroll saw which he kept in his attic. His dearest possessions were some little pill bottles that purported to contain grains of wheat from the Holy Land, water from the Jordan and the Dead Sea, and earth from the Mount of Olives. His father had bought these dull things from a Baptist missionary who peddled them, and Tip seemed to derive great satisfaction from their remote origin. The tall boy was Arthur Adams. He had fine hazel eyes that were almost too reflective and sympathetic for a boy, and such a pleasant voice that we all loved to hear him read aloud. Even when he had to read poetry aloud at school, no one ever thought of laughing. To be sure, he was not at school very much of the time. He was seventeen and should have finished the high school the year before, but he was always off somewhere with his gun. Arthur's mother was dead, and his father, who was feverishly absorbed in promoting schemes, wanted to send the boy away to school and get him off his hands, but Arthur always begged off for another year and promised to study. I remember him as a tall, brown boy with an intelligent face, always lounging among a lot of us little fellows, laughing at us oftener than with us, but with such a soft, satisfied laugh that we felt rather flattered when we provoked it. 
In after years, people said that Arthur had become given to evil ways, even as a lad, and it is true that we often saw him with the gambler's sons and with old Spanish Fanny's boy, but if he learned anything ugly in their company, he never betrayed it to us. We would have followed Arthur anywhere, and I am bound to say that he led us into no worse places than the cattail marshes and the stubble fields. These, then, were the boys who camped with me that summer night upon the sandbar. After we finished our supper, we beat the willow thicket for driftwood. By the time we had collected enough, night had fallen, and the pungent, weedy smell from the shore increased with the coolness. We threw ourselves down about the fire and made another futile effort to show Percy Pound the little dipper. We had tried it often before, but he never could get past the big one. "'You see those three big stars just below the handle, with the bright one in the middle?' said Otto Hostler. "'That's Orion's belt, and the bright one is the clasp.' I crawled behind Otto's shoulder and sighted up his arm to the star that seemed perched upon the tip of his steady forefinger. The Hostler boys did sign fishing at night, and they knew a good many stars. Percy gave up the little dipper and lay back on the sand, his hands clasped under his head. "'I can see the North Star,' he announced contentedly, pointing toward it with his big toe. "'Anyone might get lost and need to know that.' We all looked up at it. "'How do you suppose Columbus felt when his compass didn't point north any more?' Tip asked. Otto shook his head. "'My father says that there was another North Star once, and that maybe this one won't last for always. I wonder what would happen to us down here if anything went wrong with it.' Arthur chuckled. I wouldn't worry, Ott. Nothing's apt to happen to it in your time. Look at the Milky Way. There must be lots of good dead Indians. We lay back and looked, meditating at the dark cover of the world. The gurgle of the water had become heavier. We had often noticed a mutinous, complaining note in it at night, quite different from its cheerful daytime chuckle, and seeming like the voice of a much deeper and more powerful stream. Our water had always been these two moods, the one of sunny complacence, the other of inconsolable, passionate regret. "'Queer how the stars are all in sort of diagrams,' remarked Otto. "'You could do most any proposition in geometry with them. They always look as if they meant something. Some folks say everybody's fortune is all written out in the stars, don't they?' "'They believe so in the old country,' Fritz affirmed. But Arthur only laughed at him. "'You're thinking of Napoleon, Fritzy. "'He had a star that went out when he began to lose battles. "'I guess the stars don't keep any close tally on Sandtown, folks.' "'We were speculating on how many times we could count a hundred "'before the evening star went down behind the cornfields, "'when someone cried, "'There comes the moon, and it's as big as a cartwheel.' "'We all jumped up to greet it as it swam over the bluffs behind us. "'It came up like a galleon in full sail.' an enormous, barbaric thing, red as an angry, heathen god. When the moon came up red like that, the Aztecs used to sacrifice their prisoners on the temple top, Percy announced. Go on, Perce, you got that out of golden days. Do you believe that, Arthur? I appealed. Arthur answered quite seriously. Like as not. The moon was one of their gods. When my father was in Mexico City, he saw the stone where they used to sacrifice their prisoners. As we dropped down by the fire again, someone asked whether the mound builders were older than the Aztecs. When we once got upon the mound builders, we never willingly got away from them, and we were still conjecturing when we heard a loud splash in the water. "'Must have been a big cat jumping,' said Fritz. "'They do sometimes. They must see bugs in the dark. Look what a track the moon makes.' There was a long, silvery streak on the water, and where the current fretted up over a big log, it boiled up like gold pieces. "'Suppose there ever was any gold hid away in this old river?' Fritz asked. He lay like a little brown Indian, close to the fire, his chin on his hand and his bare feet in the air. His brother laughed at him, but Arthur took the suggestion seriously. "'Some of the Spaniards thought there was gold up here somewhere. Seven cities chunk full of gold they had it.' and Coronado and his men came up to hunt it. The Spaniards were all over this country once. Percy looked interested. Was that before the Mormons went through? We all laughed at this. Long enough before, before the Pilgrim Fathers, Pierce. Maybe they came along this very river. They always followed the water courses. 
"'I wonder where this river really does begin,' Tip mused. That was an old and favorite mystery which the map did not clearly explain. On the map, the little black line stopped somewhere in western Kansas. But since rivers generally rose in mountains, it was only reasonable to suppose that ours came from the Rockies. Its destination, we knew, was the Missouri, and the Hostler boys always maintained that we could embark at Sandtown in flood time, follow our noses, and eventually arrive at New Orleans. Now they took up their old argument. If us boys had grit enough to try it, it wouldn't take no time to get to Kansas City and St. Joe. We began to talk about the places we wanted to go to. The Hostler boys wanted to see the stockyards in Kansas City, and Percy wanted to see a big store in Chicago. Arthur was interlocutor and did not betray himself. Now it's your turn, Tip. Tip rolled over on his elbow and poked the fire, and his eyes looked shyly out of his queer, tight little face. My place is awfully far away. My Uncle Bill told me about it. Tip's Uncle Bill was a wanderer, bitten with mining fever, who had drifted into Sandtown with a broken arm, and when it was well, had drifted out again. Where is it? Ah, oh, it's down in New Mexico somewhere. There aren't no railroads or anything. You have to go on mules, and you run out of water before you get there and have to drink canned tomatoes. Well, go on, kid. What's it like when you do get there? Tip sat up and excitedly began his story. There's a big red rock there that goes right up out of the sand for about 900 feet. The county's flat all around it, and this here rock goes up all by itself like a monument. They call it the Enchanted Bluff down there, because no white man has ever been on top of it. The sides are smooth rock and straight up like a wall. The Indians say that Hundreds of years ago, before the Spaniards came, there was a village way up there in the air. The tribe that lived there had some sort of steps made out of wood and bark, hung down over the face of the bluff, and the braves went down to hunt and carried water up in big jugs swung on their backs. They kept a big supply of water and dried meat up there, and never went down except to hunt. They were a peaceful tribe that made cloth and pottery, and they went up there to get out of the wars. You see, they could pick off any war party that tried to get up their little steps. The Indians say they were a handsome people and that they had some sort of a queer religion. Uncle Bill thinks they were cliff dwellers who had got into trouble and left home. They weren't fighters, anyhow. One time the Braves were down hunting, and an awful storm came up, a kind of water spout, and when they got back to their rock they found their little staircase had been all broken to pieces and only a few steps were left hanging away up in the air. While they were camped at the foot of the rock, wondering what to do, a war party from the north came along and massacred them to a man, with all the old folks and women looking on from the rock. Then the war party went on south and left the village to get down the best they could. Of course, they never got down. They starved to death up there. And when the war party came back on their way north, they could hear the children crying out from the edge of the bluff where they had crawled out but they didn't see a sign of a grown Indian. And nobody has ever been up there since. We exclaimed at this dolorous legend and sat up. There couldn't have been many people up there, Percy demurred. How big is the top, Tip? Oh, pretty big. Big enough so the rock doesn't look nearly as tall as it is. The top's bigger than the base. The bluff is sort of worn away for several hundred feet up. That's one reason it's so hard to climb. I asked how the Indians got up in the first place. Nobody knows how they got up, or when. A hunting party came along once and saw that there was a town up there, and that was all. Otto rubbed his chin and looked thoughtful. Of course, there must have been some way to get up there. Couldn't people get a rope over some way and pull a ladder up? Tip's little eyes were shining with excitement. I know a way. Me and Uncle Bill talked it all over. There's a kind of rocket that would take a rope over. Lifesavers use them. And then you could hoist a rope ladder and peg it down at the bottom and make it tight with guy ropes on the other side. I'm going to climb that there bluff, and I've got it all planned out. Fritz asked what he expected to find when he got up there. Bones, maybe, or the ruins of their town, or pottery, or some of their idols. There might be most anything up there. Anyway, I want to see. Sure nobody else has been up there, Tip? Arthur asked. Dead sure. Hardly anybody ever goes down there. 
Some hunters tried to cut steps in the rock once, and they didn't get higher than a man can reach. The bluff's all red granite, and Uncle Bill thinks it's a boulder the glaciers left. It's a queer place, anyhow. Nothing but cactus and desert for hundreds of miles, and yet right under the bluff there's good water and plenty of grass. That's why the bison used to go down there. Suddenly we heard a scream above our fire and jumped up to see a dark, slim bird floating southward far above us, a whooping crane we knew by her cry and her long neck. We ran to the edge of the island, hoping we might see her alight, but she wavered southward along the river course until we lost her. The hostler boys declared by the look of the heavens it must be after midnight, so we threw more wood on our fire, put on our jackets, and curled down in the warm sand. Several of us pretended to doze, but I fancy we were really thinking about Tip's Bluff and the extinct people. Over in the wood the ring doves were calling mournfully to one another, and once we heard a dog bark far away. Somebody getting into old Tommy's melon patch, Fritz murmured sleepily, but nobody answered him. By and by Percy spoke out of the shadow. Say, Tip, when you go down there will you take me with you? Maybe. Suppose one of us beats you down there, Tip. Whoever gets to the bluff first has got to promise to tell the rest of us exactly what he finds, remarked one of the hostler boys, and to this we all readily assented. Somewhat reassured, I dropped off to sleep. I must have dreamed about a race for the bluff, for I woke in a kind of fear that other people were getting ahead of me and that I was losing my chance. I sat up in my damp clothes and looked at the other boys, who lay tumbled in uneasy attitudes about the dead fire. It was still dark, but the sky was blue with the last wonderful azure of night. The stars glistened like crystal globes and trembled as if they shone through a depth of clear water. Even as I watched, they began to pale and the sky brightened. Day came suddenly, almost instantaneously. I turned for another look at the blue night, and it was gone. Everywhere the birds began to call, and all manner of little insects began to chirp and hop about in the willows. A breeze sprang up from the west and brought the heavy smell of ripened corn. The boys rolled over and shook themselves. We stripped and plunged into the river just as the sun came up over the windy bluffs. When I came home to Sandtown at Christmas time, we skated out to our island and talked over the whole project of the enchanted bluff, renewing our resolution to find it. Although that was twenty years ago, none of us have ever climbed the enchanted bluff. Percy Pound is a stockbroker in Kansas City and will go nowhere that his red touring car cannot carry him. Otto Hassler went on the railroad and lost his foot breaking, after which he and Fritz succeeded their father as the town tailors. Arthur sat around the sleepy little town all his life. He died before he was twenty-five. The last time I saw him, when I was home on one of my college vacations, he was sitting in a steamer chair under a cottonwood tree in the little yard behind one of the two sand town saloons. He was very untidy, and his hand was not steady, but when he rose unabashed to greet me, his eyes were as clear and warm as ever. When I had talked with him for an hour and heard him laugh again, I wondered how it was that when nature had taken such pains with such a man, from his hands to the arch of his long foot, she had ever lost him in Sandtown. He joked about Tip Smith's bluff, and declared he was going down there as soon as the weather got cooler. He thought the Grand Canyon might be worth while, too. I was perfectly sure when I left him that he would never get beyond the high plank fence and the comfortable shade of the cottonwood, and indeed it was under that very tree that he died one summer morning. Tip Smith still talks about going to New Mexico, he married a slatternly, unthrifty country girl, has been much tied to a perambulator, and has grown stooped and gray from irregular meals and broken sleep. But the worst of his difficulties are now over, and he has, as he says, come into easy water. When I was last in Sandtown, I walked home with him late one moonlight night, after he had balanced his cash and shut up his store. We took the long way around, and sat on the schoolhouse steps, and between us we quite revived the romance of the lone red rock and the extinct people. Tip insists that he still means to go down there, but he thinks now that he will wait until his boy Bert is old enough to go with him. 
Bert has been let into the story and thinks of nothing but the enchanted bluff. End of The Enchanted Bluff by Willa Cather Read by Winston Tharp The Glorious Scot by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London I have some papers here, said my friend Sherlock Holmes, as we sat one winter's night on either side of the fire which I really think, Watson, that would be worth your while to glance over. These are the documents in the extraordinary case of the glorious Scott, and this is the message which struck justice of the peace Trevor dead with horror when he read it. He had picked from a drawer a little tarnished cylinder, and, undoing the tape, he handed me a short note scrawled upon a half-sheet of slate-grey paper. The supply of game for London is going steadily up, it ran. Head keeper Hudson, we believe, has been now told to receive all orders for flypaper and for preservation of your hen pheasant's life. As I glanced up from reading this enigmatical message, I saw Holmes chuckling at the expression upon my face. You look a little bewildered, said he. I cannot see how such a message as this could inspire horror. It seems to me to be rather grotesque than otherwise. Very likely, yet the fact remains that the reader, who was a fine, robust old man, was not cleaned down by it as if it had been the butt-end of a pistol. You aroused my curiosity, said I, but why did you say just now that there were very particular reasons why I should study this case? because it was the first in which I was ever engaged. I had often endeavoured to elicit from my companion what had first turned his mind in the direction of criminal research, but had never caught him before in a communicative humour. Now he sat forward in his armchair and spread out the documents upon his knees. Then he lit his pipe and sat for some time smoking and turning them over. "'You never heard me talk of Victor Trevor?' he asked. He was the only friend I made during the two years I was at college. I was never a very sociable fellow, Watson, always rather fond of moping in my rooms and working out my own little methods of thought, so that I never mix much with the men of my year. Bar fencing and boxing I had few athletic tastes, and then my line of study was quite distinct from that of the other fellows, so that we had no points of contact at all. Trevor was the only man I knew, and that only through the accident of his bull terrier freezing on my ankle one morning as I went down to chapel. It was a prosaic way of forming a friendship, but it was very effective. I was laid by the heels for ten days, but Trevor used to come in to inquire after me. At first it was only a minute's chat, but soon his visits lengthened, and before the end of the term we were close friends. He was a hearty, full-blooded fellow, full of spirits and energy, the very opposite to me in most respects, but we had some subjects in common, and it was a bond of union when I found that he was as friendless as I. Finally, he invited me down to his father's place at Donnithorpe in Norfolk, and I accepted his hospitality for a month of the long vacation. Old Trevor was evidently a man of some wealth and consideration, a J.P. and a landed proprietor. Donnithorpe is a little hamlet just to the north of Langmere in the country of the Broads. The house was an old-fashioned, widespread, oak-beamed brick building with a fine lime-lined avenue leading up to it there was excellent wild duck shooting in the fens remarkably good fishing a small but select library taken over as i understood from a former occupant and a tolerable cook so that he would be a fastidious man who could not put in a pleasant month there trevor senior was a widower and my friend his only son 
There had been a daughter, I heard, but she had died of diphtheria while on a visit to Birmingham. The father interested me extremely. He was a man of little culture, but with a considerable amount of rude strength, both physically and mentally. He knew hardly any books, but he had travelled far, had seen much of the world, and had remembered all that he had learned. In person he was a thick-set, burly man with a shock of grizzled hair, a brown, weather-beaten face, and blue eyes which were keen to the verge of fierceness. Yet he had a reputation for kindness and charity on the countryside, and was noted for the leniency of his sentences from the bench. One evening, shortly after my arrival, we were sitting over a glass of port after dinner when young Trevor began to talk about those habits of observation and inference which I had already formed into a system, although I had not yet appreciated the part which they were to play in my life. The old man evidently thought that his son was exaggerating in his description of one or two trivial feats which I had performed. "'Come now, Mr. Holmes,' said he, laughing good-humouredly. "'I'm an excellent subject, if you can deduce anything from me.' "'I fear there's not very much,' I answered. "'I might suggest that you have gone about in fear of some personal attack within the last twelve months.' The laugh faded from his lips, and he stared at me in great surprise. "'Well, that's true enough,' said he. "'You know, Victor,' turning to his son, "'when we broke up that poaching gang, they swore to knife us, "'and Sir Edward Holly has actually been attacked. "'I've always been on my guard since then, "'though I have no idea how you know it.' "'You have a very handsome stick,' I answered. "'By the inscription I observed that you had not had it more than a year, "'but you have taken some pains to bore the head of it, and pour melted lead into the hole so as to make it a formidable weapon. I argued that you would not take such precautions unless you had some danger to fear. Anything else? he asked, smiling. You have boxed a good deal in your youth. Right again. How did you know it? Is my nose knocked a little out of the straight? No, said I. It's your ears. They have the peculiar flattening and thickening which marks the boxing man. Anything else? You have done a good deal of digging by your calluses. Made all my money at the gold fields. You have been in New Zealand? Right again. You have visited Japan? Quite true. And you have been most intimately associated with someone whose initials were J.A. and whom you afterwards were eager to entirely forget. Mr. Trevor stood slowly up, fixed his large blue eyes upon me with a strange wild stare, and then pitched forward with his face among the nutshells which strewed the cloth in a dead faint. You can imagine, Watson, how shocked both his son and I were. His attack did not last long, however, for when we undid his collar and sprinkled the water from one of the finger glasses over his face, he gave a gasp or two and sat up. "'Ah, oh, boys,' said he, forcing a smile, "'I hope I haven't frightened you. Strong as I look, there is a weak place in my heart.' and it does not take much to knock me over. I don't know how you manage this, Mr. Holmes, but it seems to me that all the detectives of fact and of fancy would be children in your hands. That's your line of life, sir, and you may take the word of a man who has seen something of the world. And that recommendation, with the exaggerated estimate of my ability with which he prefaced it, was, if you will believe me, Watson, the very first thing which ever made me feel that a profession might be made out of what had up to that time been the merest hobby. At the moment, however, I was too much concerned at the sudden illness of my host to think of anything else. I hope I have said nothing to pain you, said I. Well, you certainly touched upon rather a tender point. Might I ask how you know and how much you know? He spoke now in a half-jesting fashion, but a look of terror still lurked at the back of his eyes. "'It is simplicity itself,' said I. "'When you bared your arm to draw that fish into the boat, "'I saw that J.A. had been tattooed in the bend of the elbow. "'The letters were still legible, "'but it was perfectly clear from their blurred appearance "'and from the staining of the skin round them "'that efforts had been made to obliterate them.' It was obvious, then, that those initials had once been very familiar to you, and that you had afterwards wished to forget them. 
"'What an eye you have!' he cried, with a sigh of relief. "'It is just as you say, but we won't talk of it. "'Of all ghosts, the ghosts of our old lovers are the worst. "'Come into the billiard room and have a quiet cigar.' From that day, amid all his cordiality, there was always a touch of suspicion in Mr. Trevor's manner towards me. Even his son remarked it. "'You've given the governor such a turn,' said he, "'that you will never be sure again of what you know and what you don't know.' He did not mean to show it, I am sure, but it was so strongly in his mind that it peeped out at every action. At last... I became so convinced that I was causing him uneasiness that I drew my visit to a close. On the very day, however, before I left, an incident occurred which proved, in the sequel, to be of importance. We were sitting out upon the lawn on garden chairs, the three of us basking in the sun and admiring the view across the broads, when a maid came out to say that there was a man at the door who wanted to see Mr. Trevor. "'What is his name?' asked my host. "'He would not give any. "'What does he want, then?' "'He says that you know him "'and that he only wants a moment's conversation. "'Show him round here.' "'An instant afterwards there appeared "'a little wizened fellow "'with a cringing manner "'and a shambling style of walking. "'He wore an open jacket "'with a splotch of tar on the sleeve, "'a red and black check shirt, "'dungaree trousers, "'and heavy boots badly worn.' His face was thin and brown and crafty, with a perpetual smile upon it, which showed an irregular line of yellow teeth, and his crinkled hands were half-closed in a way that is distinctive of sailors. As he came slouching across the lawn, I heard Mr. Trevor make a sort of hiccoughing noise in his throat, and jumping out of his chair he ran into the house. He was back in a moment, and I smelt a strong reek of brandy as he passed me. "'Well, my man,' said he, "'what can I do for you?' The sailor stood looking at him with puckered eyes and with the same loose-lipped smile upon his face. "'You don't know me?' he asked. "'Why, dear me, it is surely Hudson,' said Mr. Trevor in a tone of surprise. "'Hudson it is, sir,' said the seaman. "'Why, it's thirty year and more since I saw you last.' Here you are in your house, and me still picking my salt meat out of the harness cask. Tut, you'll find that I have not forgotten old times, cried Mr. Trevor, and walking towards the sailor, he said something in a low voice. Go into the kitchen, he continued out loud, and you will get food and drink. I have no doubt that I shall find you a situation. Thank you, sir, said the seaman, touching his forelock. I am just off a two-year in an eight-knot tramp. "'short-handed at that, and I want a rest. "'I thought I'd get it either with Mr. Beddoes or with you.' "'Ah!' cried Trevor. "'You know where Mr. Beddoes is?' "'Bless you, sir, I know where all my old friends are,' "'said the fellow with a sinister smile, "'and he slouched off after the maid to the kitchen. "'Mr. Trevor mumbled something to us about "'having been shipmate with the man "'when he was going back to the diggings, and then, leaving us on the lawn, he went indoors. An hour later, when we entered the house, we found him stretched dead drunk upon the dining-room sofa. The whole incident left a most ugly impression upon my mind, and I was not sorry next day to leave Donnythorpe behind me, for I felt that my presence must be a source of embarrassment to my friend. All this occurred during the first month of the long vacation. I went up to my London rooms, where I spent seven weeks working out a few experiments in organic chemistry. One day, however, when the autumn was far advanced and the vacation drawing to a close, I received a telegram from my friend imploring me to return to Donnythorpe and saying that he was in great need of my advice and assistance. Of course, I dropped everything and set out for the north once more. He met me with the dog-cart at the station, and I saw, at a glance, that the last two months had been very trying ones for him. He had grown thin and careworn, and had lost the loud, cheery manner for which he had been remarkable. "'The governor is dying,' were the first words he said. "'Impossible!' I cried. "'What is the matter?' "'Apoplexy. Nervous shock. He's been on the verge all day. I doubt if we shall find him alive. 
I was, as you may think, Watson, horrified at this unexpected news. What has caused it? I asked. Ah, oh, that is the point. Jump in and we can talk it over while we drive. You remember that fellow who came upon the evening before you left us? Perfectly. Did you know who it was that we let into the house that day? I have no idea. It was the devil, Holmes, he cried. I stared at him in astonishment. Yes, it was the devil himself. We have not had a peaceful hour since, not one. The governor has never held up his head from that evening. And now the life has been crushed out of him and his heart broken, all through this accursed Hudson. What power had he then? Ah, that is what I would give so much to know. The kindly, charitable, good old governor, how could he have fallen into the clutches of such a ruffian? But I am so glad that you have come, Holmes. I trust very much to your judgment and discretion, and I know that you will advise me for the best. We were dashing along the smooth white country road, with the long stretch of the broads in front of us glimmering in the red light of the setting sun. From a grove upon our left I could already see the high chimneys and the flagstaff which marked the squire's dwelling. My father made the fellow gardener, said my companion, and then, as that did not satisfy him, he was promoted to be butler. The house seemed to be at his mercy, and he wandered about and did what he chose in it. The maids complained of his drunken habits and his vile language. The dad raised their wages all round to recompense them for their annoyance. The fellow would take the boat and my father's best gun and treat himself to little shooting trips, and all this with such a sneering, leering, insolent face that I would have knocked him down twenty times over if he had been a man of my own age. I tell you, Holmes, I've had to keep a tight hold upon myself all this time, and now I'm asking myself whether if I had let myself go a little more, I might not have been a wiser man. Well, matters went from bad to worse with us, and this animal Hudson became more and more intrusive, until at last, on making some insolent reply to my father in my presence one day, I took him by the shoulders and turned him out of the room. He slunk away with a livid face and two venomous eyes which uttered more threats than his tongue could do. I don't know what passed between the poor dad and him after that, but the dad came to me next day and asked me whether I would mind apologising to Hudson. I refused, as you can imagine, and asked my father how he could allow such a wretch to take such liberties with himself and his household. Ah, oh, my boy, said he, it is all very well to talk, but you don't know how I am placed. But you shall know, Victor, I'll see that you shall know, come what may. You wouldn't believe harm of your poor old father, would you, lad? He was very much moved, and shut himself up in the study all day, where I could see through the window that he was writing busily. That evening there came what seemed to me to be a grand release, for Hudson told us that he was going to leave us. He walked into the dining room as we sat after dinner, and announced his intention in the thick voice of a half-drunken man. Oh, I've had enough of Norfolk, said he. Oh, run down to Mr. Beddoes in Hampshire. He'll be as glad to see me as you were, I dare say. You're not going away in an unkind spirit, Hudson, I hope, said my father with a tameness which made my blood boil. I've not had my apology, said he sulkily, glancing in my direction. Victor, you will acknowledge that you have used this worthy fellow rather roughly, said the dad, turning to me. On the contrary, I think that we have both shown extraordinary patience towards him, I answered. Oh, you do, do you? he snarled. Very good, mate. We'll see about that. He slouched out of the room and half an hour afterwards left the house, leaving my father in a state of pitiable nervousness. Night after night I heard him pacing his room, and it was just as he was recovering his confidence that the blow did at last fall. And how? I asked eagerly, in a most extraordinary fashion. A letter arrived for my father yesterday evening, bearing the Fordingbridge postmark. My father read it, 
clapped both his hands to his head and began running round the room in little circles like a man who has been driven out of his senses. When I at last drew him down on to the sofa, his mouth and eyelids were all puckered on one side, and I saw that he had a stroke. Dr. Fordham came over at once. We put him to bed, but the paralysis has spread. He has shown no signs of returning consciousness, and I think that we shall hardly find him alive. You horrify me, Trevor, I cried. What then could have been in this letter to cause so dreadful a result? Nothing. There lies the inexplicable part of it. The message was observed and trivial. Ah, my God, it is as I feared. As he spoke, we came round the curve of the avenue and saw in the fading light that every blind in the house had been drawn down. As we dashed up to the door, my friend's face convulsed with grief. A gentleman in black emerged from it. When did it happen, doctor? asked Trevor. Almost immediately after you left. Did he recover consciousness? For an instant before the end. Any message for me? Only that the papers were in the back drawer of the Japanese cabinet. My friend ascended with the doctor to the chamber of death while I remained in the study, turning the whole matter over and over in my head, and feeling as sombre as ever I had done in my life. What was the past of this Trevor, pugilist, traveller and gold digger, and how had he placed himself in the power of this acid-faced seaman? Why, too, should he faint at an allusion to the half-effaced initials upon his arm, and die of fright when he had a letter from Fordingham? Then I remembered that Fordingham was in Hampshire, and that this Mr. Beddoes, whom the seaman had gone to visit, and presumably to blackmail, had also been mentioned as living in Hampshire. The letter then might either come from Hudson, the seaman, saying that he had betrayed the guilty secret which appeared to exist, or it might come from Beddoes, warning an old confederate that such a betrayal was imminent. So far it seemed clear enough, but then how could this letter be trivial and grotesque as described by the son he must have misread it if so it must have been one of those ingenious secret codes which mean one thing while they seem to mean another i must see this letter if there were a hidden meaning in it i was confident that i could pluck it forth for an hour i sat pondering over it in the gloom until at last the weeping maid brought in a lamp and close at her heels came my friend trevor pale but composed with these very papers which lie upon my knee, held in his grasp. He sat down opposite to me, drew the lamp to the edge of the table, and handed me a short note scribbled, as you see, upon a single sheet of grey paper. The supply of game for London is going steadily up, it ran. Head keeper Hudson, we believe, has been now told to receive all orders for fly paper and for preservation of your hen pheasant's life. I dare say my face looked as bewildered as yours did just now when first I read this message. Then I re-read it very carefully. It was evidently as I had thought, and some secret meaning must lie buried in this strange combination of words. Or could it be that there was a prearranged significance to such phrases as flypaper and hen pheasant? such a meaning would be arbitrary and could not be deduced in any way and yet i was loath to believe that this was the case and the presence of the word hudson seemed to show that the subject of the message was as i had guessed and that it was from beddoes rather than the sailor i tried it backwards but the combination life pheasant's hen was not encouraging then i tried alternate words but neither the of four nor supply game london promised to throw any light upon it and then in an instant the key of the riddle was in my hands and i saw that every third word beginning with the first would give a message which might well drive old trevor to despair it was short and terse the warning as i now read it to my companion the game is up hudson has told all fly for your life victor trevor sank his face into his shaking hands it must be that i suppose said he this is worse than death for it means disgrace as well. But what is the meaning of these head-keepers and hen-pheasants? It means nothing to the message, but it might mean a good deal to us if we had no other means of discovering the sender. You see that he has begun by writing, The game is, and so on. 
Afterwards he had, to fulfil the prearranged cipher, to fill in any two words in each space. He would naturally use the first words which came to his mind, and if there were so many which referred to sport among them, you may be tolerably sure that he is either an ardent shot or interested in breeding. Do you know anything about this Beddoes? Why, now that you mention it, said he, I remember that my poor father used to have an invitation from him to shoot over his preserves every autumn. Then it is undoubtedly from him that the note comes, said I. It only remains for us to find out what this secret was which the sailor Hudson seems to have held over the heads of these two wealthy and respected men. Alas, Holmes, I fear that it is one of sin and shame, cried my friend, but from you I should have no secrets. Here is the statement which was drawn up by my father when he knew that the danger from Hudson had become imminent. I found it in the Japanese cabinet, as he told the doctor. Take it and read it to me, for I have neither the strength nor the courage to do it myself. These are the very papers, Watson, which he handed to me, and I will read them to you, as I read them in the old study that night to him. They are endorsed outside, as you see. Some particulars of the voyage of the bark Gloria Scott, from her leaving Falmouth on the 8th of October, 1855, to her destruction in north latitude 15 degrees 20, west long 25 degrees 14, on November the 6th. It is in the form of a letter and runs in this way. My dear, dear son, now that approaching disgrace begins to darken the closing years of my life, I can write with all truth and honesty that it is not the terror of the law, it is not the loss of my position in the county, nor is it my fall in the eyes of all who have known me, which cuts me to the heart, but it is the thought that you should come to blush for me, you who loved me and who have seldom, I hope, had reason to do other than respect me. But if the blow falls, which is forever hanging over me, then I should wish you to read this, that you may know straight from me how far I have been to blame. On the other hand, if all should go well, which may kind God Almighty grant, then, if by any chance this paper should be still undestroyed and should fall into your hands, I conjure you, by all you hold sacred, by the memory of your dear mother, and by the love which had been between us, to hurl it into the fire, and to never give one thought to it again. If then your eye goes on to read this line, I know that I shall already have been exposed and dragged from my home, or as is more likely, for you know that my heart is weak, by lying with my tongue sealed for ever in death. In either case the time for suppression is past, and every word which I tell you is the naked truth, and this I swear as I hope for mercy. My name, dear lad, is not Trevor. I was James Armitage in my younger days, and you can understand now the shock that it was to me a few weeks ago when your college friend addressed me in words which seemed to imply that he had surprised my secret. As Armitage it was that I entered a London banking house, and as Armitage I was convicted of breaking my country's laws and was sentenced to transportation. Do not think very harshly of me, laddie. It was a debt of honour, so-called, which I had to pay, and I used money which was not my own to do it, in the certainty that I could replace it before there could be any possibility of it being missed. But the most dreadful ill-luck pursued me. The money which I had reckoned upon never came to hand, and a premature examination of accounts exposed my deficit. The case might have been dealt leniently with, but the laws were more harshly administered thirty years ago than now, and on my twenty-third birthday I found myself chained as a felon with thirty-seven other convicts in tween decks of the bark Gloria Scott, bound for Australia. It was the year fifty-five when the Crimean War was at its height, and the old convict ships had been largely used as transports in the Black Sea. The government was compelled, therefore, to use smaller and less suitable vessels for sending out their prisoners. The Gloria Scott had been in the Chinese tea trade, but she was an old-fashioned, heavy-bowed, broad-beamed craft, and the new clippers had cut her out. She was a 500-ton boat, and besides her 38 jailbirds, 
she carried twenty-six of a crew eighteen soldiers a captain three mates a doctor a chaplain and four warders nearly a hundred souls were in her all told when we set sail from falmouth the partitions between the cells of the convicts instead of being of thick oak as is usual in convict ships were quite thin and frail the man next to me upon the aft side was one whom i particularly noticed when we were led down the quay he was a young man with a clear hairless face a long thin nose and rather nutcracker jaws he carried his head very jauntily in the air had a swaggering style of walking and was above all else remarkable for his extraordinary height i don't think any of our heads would have come up to his shoulder and i am sure that he could not have measured less than six and a half feet it was strange among so many sad and weary faces to see one which was full of energy and resolution the sight of it was to me like a fire in a snowstorm i was glad then to find that he was my neighbour and gladder still when in the dead of the night i heard a whisper close to my ear and found that he had managed to cut an opening in the board which separated us hello chummy said he what's your name and what are you here for i answered him and asked in turn who i was talking with i'm jack prendergast said he and by god you'll learn to bless my name before you've done with me i remembered hearing of his case for it was one which had made an immense sensation throughout the country some time before my own arrest he was a man of good family and of great ability but of incurably vicious habits who had by an ingenious system of fraud obtained huge sums of money from the leading london merchants ah ha, ha you remember my case he said proudly very well indeed then maybe you remember something queer about it what was that then i had nearly a quarter of a million hadn't i so it was said but none was recovered eh no well where do you suppose the balance is he asked i have no idea said i right between my finger and thumb he cried by god i've got more pounds to my name than you've got hairs on your head and if you've money my son and know how to handle it and spread it you can do anything now you don't think it likely that a man who could do anything is going to wear his breeches out sitting in the stinking hold of a rat-gutted beetle-ridden mouldy old coffin of a china coaster no sir such a man will look after himself and will look after his chums you may lay to that you hold on to him and you may kiss the book that he'll haul you through that was his style of talk and at first i thought it meant nothing but after a while when he had tested me and sworn me in with all possible solemnity he let me understand that there really was a plot to gain command of the vessel a dozen of the prisoners had hatched it before they came aboard prendergast was the leader and his money was the motive power i had a partner said he a rare good man as true as a stock to a barrel he's got the dibs he has and where do you think he is at this moment why he's the chaplain of this ship the chaplain no less he came aboard with a black coat and his papers right and money enough in his box to buy the thing right up from keel to main truck the crew are his body and soul he could buy em at so much a gross with a cash discount and he did it before ever they signed on he's got two of the warders and maria the second mate and he'd get the captain himself if he thought him worth it what are we to do then i asked what do you think said he we'll make the coats of some of these soldiers redder than ever the tailor did but they are armed said i and so shall we be my boy there's a brace of pistols for every mother's son of us and if we can't carry the ship with the crew at our back it's time we were all sent to a young mrs boarding school you speak to your mate upon the left to-night and see if he is to be trusted i did so and found my other neighbour to be a young fellow in much the same position as myself whose crime had been forgery his name was evans but he afterwards changed it like myself and he is now a rich and prosperous man in the south of england he was ready enough to join the conspiracy as the only means of saving ourselves and before we had crossed the bay there were only two of the prisoners who were not in the secret one of these was a weak mind and we did not dare to trust him 
and the other was suffering from jaundice and could not be of any use to us. From the beginning there was really nothing to prevent us from taking possession of the ship. The crew were a set of ruffians specially picked for the job. The sham chaplain came into our cells to exhort us, carrying a black bag, supposed to be full of tracks, and so often did he come that by the third day we had each stowed away at the foot of our beds a file, a brace of pistols, a pound of powder, and twenty slugs. Two of the warders were agents of Prendergast, and the second mate was his right-hand man. The captain, the two mates, two warders, Lieutenant Martin, his eighteen soldiers, and the doctor were all that we had against us. Yet safe as it was, we determined to neglect no precaution, and to make our attack suddenly by night. It came, however, more quickly than we expected, and in this way. One evening, about the third week after our start, the doctor had come down to see one of the prisoners, who was ill and putting his hand down on the bottom of his bunk, he felt the outline of the pistols. If he had been silent, he might have blown the whole thing, but he was a nervous little chap, so he gave a cry of surprise and turned so pale that the man knew what was up in an instant and seized him. He was gagged before he could give the alarm and tied down upon the bed. He had unlocked the door that led to the deck, and we were through it in a rush. The two sentries were shot down, and so was a corporal who came running to see what was the matter. There were two more soldiers at the door of the stateroom, and their muskets seemed not to be loaded, for they never fired upon us, and they were shot while trying to fix their bayonets. Then we rushed on into the captain's cabin, but as we pushed open the door there was an explosion from within, and there he lay with his brains smeared over the chart of the Atlantic, which was pinned upon the table, while the chaplain stood with a smoking pistol in his hand, at his elbow. The two mates had both been seized by the crew, and the whole business seemed to be settled. The stateroom was next to the cabin, and we flocked in there and flopped down on the settees, all speaking together, for we were just mad with the feeling that we were free once more. There were lockers all round, and Wilson, the sham chaplain, knocked one of them in and pulled out a dozen of brown sherry. We cracked off with the necks of the bottles, poured the stuff out into tumblers, and were just tossing them off, when in an instant without warning there came the roar of muskets in their ears, and the saloon was so full of smoke that you could not see across the table. When it cleared again the place was a shambles. Wilson and eight others were wriggling on top of each other on the floor, and the blood and the brown sherry on the table turned me sick now when I think of it. We were so cowed by the sight that I think we should have given the job up if it had not been for Prendergast. He bellowed like a bull and rushed for the door, with all that were left alive at his heels. Out we ran, and there on the poop were the lieutenant and ten of his men. The swing skylights above the saloon table had been a bit open, and they had fired on us through the slit. We got on them before they could load, and they stood to it like men, but we had the upper hand of them, and in five minutes it was all over. My God, was there ever a slaughterhouse like that ship? Prendergast was like a raging devil, and he picked the soldiers up as if they had been children and threw them overboard, alive or dead. There was one sergeant that was horribly wounded and yet kept on swimming for a surprising time until someone in mercy blew out his brains. When the fighting was over, there was no one left of our enemies except just the warders, the mates and the doctor. It was over them that the great quarrel arose. There were many of us who were glad enough to win back our freedom, and yet who had no wish to have murder on our souls. It was one thing to knock the soldiers over with their muskets in their hands, and it was another to stand by while men were being killed in cold blood. Eight of us, five convicts and three sailors, said that we would not see it done, but there was no moving Prendergast and those who were with him. Our only chance of safety lay in making a clean job of it, said he, and he would not leave a tongue with power to wag in the witness box. It nearly came to our sharing the fate of the prisoners, but at last he said that if we wished we might take a boat and go. We jumped at the offer, for we were already sick of these bloodthirsty doings, and we saw that they would be worse before it was done. We were given a suit of sailor togs each, a barrel of water, two casks, one of junk and one of biscuits and a compass. 
Prendergast threw us over a chart, told us that we were shipwrecked mariners whose ship had founded in latitude 15 degrees and longitude 25 degrees west, and then cut the painter and let us go. And now I come to the most surprising part of my story, my dear son. The seamen had hauled the foreyard aback during the rising, but now as we left them they brought it square again, and as there was a light wind from the north and east, the bark began to draw slowly away from us. Our boat lay rising and falling upon the long, smooth rollers, and Evans and I, who were the most educated of the party, were sitting in the sheets working out our position and planning what coast we should make for. It was a nice question, for the Cape to Verdes was about 500 miles to the north of us, and the African coast about 700 to the east. On the whole, as the wind was coming round to the north, we thought that Sierra Leone might be best, and turned our head in that direction, the bark being at that time nearly hull down on our starboard quarter. Suddenly, as we looked at her, we saw a dense black cloud of smoke shoot up from her, which hung like a monstrous tree upon the skyline. A few seconds later, a roar like thunder burst upon our ears, and as the smoke thinned away, there was no sign left of the Gloria Scott. In an instant we swept the boat's head round again and pulled with all our strength for the place where the haze still trailing over the water marked the scene of this catastrophe. It was a long hour before we reached it, and at first we feared that we had come too late to save anyone. A splintered boat in a number of crates and fragments of spars rising and falling on the way showed us where the vessel had foundered. But there was no sign of life, and we had turned away in despair when we heard a cry for help and saw at some distance a piece of wreckage with a man lying stretched across it. When we pulled him aboard the boat, he proved to be a young seaman of the name of Hudson, who was so burned and exhausted that he could give us no account of what had happened until the following morning. It seemed that after we had left, Prendergast and his gang had proceeded to put to death the five remaining prisoners. The two warders had been shot and thrown overboard, and also had the third mate. Prendergast then descended into the tween decks and with his own hands cut the throat of the unfortunate surgeon. There only remained the first mate, who was a bold and active man. When he saw the convict was approaching him with the bloody knife in his hand, he kicked off his bonds, which he had somehow contrived to loosen, and rushing down the deck he plunged into the afterhold. A dozen convicts, who descended with their pistols in search of him, found him with a matchbox in his hand, seated beside an open powder barrel which was one of a hundred carried on board, and swearing that he would blow all hands up if he were in any way molested. An instant later the explosion occurred, though Huston thought it was caused by the misdirected bullet of one of the convicts rather than the mate's match. Be the cause what it may, it was the end of the Gloria Scott and of the rabble who held command of her. Such, in a few words, my dear boys, the history of this terrible business in which I was involved. Next day we were picked up by the brig Hotspur, bound for Australia, whose captain found no difficulty in believing that we were the survivors of a passenger ship which had foundered. The transport ship Gloria Scott was set down by the Admiralty as being lost at sea, and no word has ever leaked out as to her true fate. After an excellent voyage, the Hotspur landed us at Sydney, where Evans and I changed our names and made our way to the diggings, where, among the crowds who were gathered from all nations, we had no difficulty in losing our former identities. The rest I need not relate. We prospered, we travelled, we came back as rich colonials to England, and we bought country estates. For more than twenty years we have led peaceful and useful lives, and we hope that our past was forever buried. Imagine, then, my feelings when, in the seaman who came to us, I recognised instantly the man who had been picked off the wreck. He had tracked us down somehow, and had set himself to live upon our fears. You will understand now how it was that I strove to keep the peace with him, and you will in some measure sympathise with me in the fears which fill me, now that he has gone from me to his other victim, with threats upon his tongue. Underneath is written, in a hand so shaky as to be hardly legible, Beddoes writes in cipher to say, H has told all, sweet Lord, have mercy on our souls. That was the narrative which I read that night to young Trevor, and I think, Watson, that under the circumstances it was a dramatic one. 
the good fellow was heartbroken at it and went out to the terre tea planting where i hear that he is doing well as to the sailor and beddoes neither of them was ever heard of again after that day on which the letter of warning was written they both disappeared utterly and completely no complaint had been lodged with the police so that beddoes had mistaken a threat for a deed hudson had been seen lurking about and it was believed by the police that he had done away with beddoes and had fled for myself i believe that the truth was exactly the opposite i think that it is most probable that beddoes pushed to desperation and believing himself to have been already betrayed had revenged himself upon hudson and had fled from the country with as much money as he could lay his hands on those are the facts of the case doctor and if they are of any use to your collection i am sure that they are very heartily at your service end of the gloria scott by sir arthur conan doyle